Um, this is kind of a rerun of a talk. Uh, me and a colleague from the Vacant did at uh, Tesla School. Uh, uh, um, we just test the test. It's about uh, continuous delivery at Vacant and especially the effort that we put into the uh, testing part of the new continuous delivery. Because it's really easy relatively to put your application on a development environment, an acceptance environment, and a production environment. But uh, you don't want to do that without some sort of uh, uh, assurance that stuff is working uh, according to you know, what it's supposed to be. So, first of all, I'll uh, do a quick introduction of the Wacom stack. It's a couple of years older than the stuff that uh, Adam explained. Um, and then we'll dive into uh, testing stuff with Wacom and the uh, deployment pipeline. So the Wacom stack, let's start on the right side. It's uh, Mesos, running Docker containers, uh, Cassandra Elasticsearch, Kafka as a database in Q, uh, functionality. And we use Prometheus for uh, monitoring and alerting. <coughs> and console is our uh, service registry and basically our, our uh, distributed uh, key value uh, store. When the project started out, like almost three years ago, I think it is, um, the principles they put up was that it should be designed to fail. So it basically means uh, having a, a resilient uh, platform, services can fall over, uh, it should restore itself. Um, mm -hmm. Basically, you know, the stuff that, that Marathon does, uh, that the Kubernetes does. Uh, metadata driven, uh, we don't want to. Uh, well, basically, like uh, uh, Adam said, with, uh, with the Docker container also comes some sort of configuration, which kind of is the metadata that, that surrounds the Docker container and the, the deployment descriptors, basically, that, that put it uh, in production. Well, service-oriented kind of explains itself if you're using microservices. Uh, TDD, always a nice exercise for developers. And, uh, of course, uh, automation. Uh, I yeah. You said those principles are three years old. Are they still valid? They are still valid. Okay. Yeah, that, that's <laughs> kind of that's well, that's really nice. I don't I don't know how well they're doing. It. Well, they're, they're doing pretty good with the TDDs thing, I suppose. At least you know, they have solid testing, mostly in the build phase already. So that's that's pretty good. Clear. Yes. Um, it's a web shop, so. You know, all your usual suspects pop up. It is a web application. Uh, we build it initially as a, a big web application that kind of sits in front of all the, the services. So, uh, services for your accounts, you know, log in, uh, uh, register yourself, stuff like that. Shopping cart, obviously. Uh, checkout functionality, really important if you have a shop. <laughs> and uh, whatever, whatever uh, comes uh, product uh, uh, services that show your product and stuff like that. Search services. So, um, when uh, we push something to the uh, master branch, um, of course you can do feature branches, but they don't get pushed onto the, uh, the test uh, environment. So you need to push it to master branch, which is really nice if you, you know, integrate stuff. It's called continuous integration. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, the build jobs that we create, they are created using uh, the uh, Yank job DSL, which is just looking into GitHub, figuring out all the uh, repositories, all the branches in the repositories, and creating build jobs for all of those. That's that's uh, pretty that's easy. definitely not three years old. <laughs> well, that's that's really well. And I started I started in March, well, and that, that's that's about started in April this year. So. It's that, and I started in March at Vagon, and uh, yes. they already had that in place. It's interesting, but uh, the pipeline will not be even mature. No, that's the pipeline. Oh, it's the JQuery stuff that is on this in there for three, two, three years. Before that, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, it is. Yeah, no, okay. okay. I was, I was so I also think that's new. Yeah. So we have a build job, of course. Uh, if you push something, then at some point, uh, start building the application. The stuff is uh, unit tested, and. Uh, uh, 
container is uh, created and pushed to a Docker Hub, which is a horrible site, by the way. Um, <laughs> you don't want to be a Docker. Um, and uh, now you have uh, to explain why. Hmm? Now you have to explain well, why. Well, uh, <laughs> first of all, uh, if you're doing an environment like this, you're doing lots of pushing and pulling to Docker registries, and having that one on the remote side just slows down stuff uh, tremendously. Um, secondly, the user interface of Docker Hub is just plain crap. So how do you solve that? Uh, from uh, we want to we wanna, uh, move stuff, or we haven't done that yet, uh, because well, we have other uh, stuff to do first, but we want to move it to uh, Artifactory. We've like our uh, libraries, the, the Scala libraries, the, the Node libraries that we built there, they are already published, already published to Artifactory. And uh, our Artifactory repository is uh, running on AWS. By the way, I didn't mention that everything runs on AWS. Um, so, there you go. Um, and then if everything is running in the same, uh, uh, in the same uh, region as uh, then everything is pretty fast. So, so this ad artifactory is from the AWS. It's not like a self -ho self-hosted applications. Um, so you can uh, artifactory. Yeah, uh, I've never heard about that. So no, artifactory is, is a different is a different company. We just take their oh. services for. Uh, it's basically uh, well what Nexus does, uh, but then with a prettier interface. Okay. You know, uh, you know, uh, so not like Nexus, I suppose. Not really. It's just, uh, oh, it's just it's sort of resource and so you, you push your stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Your resources, you push them in there and can get them later on. Um, uh, what was it? Oh yeah, I created the, the stuff on Docker, where we don't want to be. And then, uh, uh, notify the deployment pipelines. Um, I said pipelines because uh, we have a site running in Belgium and we have a site running in the Netherlands and both have a slightly different configuration. So if two deploying fibers we need to build in a third one. So we're also notifying that one. And you know if if it's a, a service that is not running on that environment, then there is no job to actually be activated and it just doesn't uh, doesn't continue when deploying stuff there. But you should choose this one. Yes. So nine months ago. Three months ago, it's uh, six months ago, so it's actually accurate. Um, uh, we had an uh, automated deployment, so there were Yankin scripts uh, in the uh, in the CD pipeline, and you could actually press the build now button, and it would deploy it to either a development or acceptance or a production environment. Um, there was end-to-end uh, -end testing, basically from the website, and you know. All the, the services were basically uh, exercised through the website, so there was end-to-end uh, -end testing uh, there, and but only um, that it was executed from the desktop. So that is <laughs> not not ideal. It's pretty bad. So uh, looking at it from a distance, uh, for historic reasons. I suppose, because it was there before I started. Uh, it started off with, with having a development environment, test environment, an acceptance environment, and a production environment. And uh, basically all the software went through these stages to production. If it, uh, and basically what you want to have if you go from one stage to the other is that there is some sort of criteria to basically promote your build to the next environment. So, uh, that's the, the idea we started working on with uh, uh, the pipeline and especially the, the testing bits in it. We wanted to have some sort of promotion criteria, like what's it like for, uh, for the site, what does it need to do at least, how, how should it work before it can be promoted from development to acceptance, and acceptance to production. Same, well, kind of the same idea for the service, but of course, yeah, so the same website behaves slightly different, so we have to deal with that. Um, so, uh, a deployment pipeline. Hey. This is one for your account service, actually. And if we look into some more detail there, 
you can actually see that here. It started off with deploying stuff to development. And then it's running a bunch of tests. And it's running functional tests, and it's running more functional tests, and it's running more functional tests, and then it's ex deploying stuff to acceptance. And then it stops here. It's like, well, there's some manual action required. I don't know how to continue there. But it needs to know that one way or another, right? I mean, this is nice for the account service, but you can imagine that a different service would have different uh, requirements when it comes to testing. It, needs, it doesn't make sense to do uh, testing for the login stuff when you're just deploying a product service that, that just serves products. So, you needed some way to uh, describe it. And the best way to know what a service is doing is to let the service tell it yourself. So, uh, we came up with um, implementing those criteria in, uh, in this case, in Docker labels. So, it's uh, basically saying here that uh, in order to do some, to go from uh, promotion to acceptance, we're going to uh, run some tests from the, the registry site service, that's actually the, the name of the, the source repository. We're going to uh, run some tests from the login site, and we're going to run our high level flow test, which is basically just doing the, the most basic flow that the user can do on the website, if you're lucky. And that's order something, you know, put something in your basket, and then go and check out and order it. And then we say, well, go to production. We say, well, let's make that a manual step. So we're not going to to uh, to actually move it to production right away. It's a matter of confidence whether you where or not you want it. So how does it work in the boot then? Same for um, the first case. Uh, the first case where we want to do the, the registry stuff. So we reference to some uh, repository through our metadata and uh, based on that information uh, thanks to the, the goofy stuff in the uh, build uh, pipeline uh, the code in Jenkins you can actually dynamically create build steps so that's what we're doing. That build step actually has to do something so in the register side, which is our, our target repository where the tests are, uh, we need some sort of handle for you know what should be done. Are those uh, protractor tests? Are they tests written in Java? Uh, I don't know. Are they actually in this very directory, or should we traverse down some other directory? You know, we don't know from the outside. So the, what we did is we put a small file there, called it dot test set, and uh, since we still we're not really sure what to do with that. We made it a shell script because you know the script is at least the, the something that, that you can easily extend, and uh, it would give us a, a nice indication of what is actually required in such functionality. It still is a shell script because it works rather well actually. Um, and um, so in the shell script, we we. Uh, we can we can target it with with a couple of uh, commands. I think the next slide is actually a shell script. Yes, there it is. So uh, we're talking about functional tests. Uh, so if test type is functional, then there are a couple of commands, and those kind of you know, this, this was our first real big uh, iteration in this stuff. So uh, we kind of figure out what does the build job need to actually do its work. First step is we want to know which test suites that are actually there to, to execute. Because if we know a bunch of test suites, we can parallelize that stuff. One job per test suite, so we're actually spawning, like if there are five test suites, spawning five jobs. So in a couple of minutes, all those tests are done. Um, before you can actually run something, you have to do some sort of install because you, know, you need dependencies. Uh, you need to uh, actually do the run stuff which in this case is uh, NPM, so it's running protractor stuff with uh, uh, Selenium or Chrome for this particular suite. It's then added all the arguments of kind of came up with sort of protocol of commands that we're going to execute in, uh, in the set order to figure out what, 
uh, well, to actually just execute those tests. Then of course we have to collect uh, our reports, the unit archive stuff, um, HTML reports, and uh, well, that's basically it. Right there. This is a small shell script in the target repository and off you go. Um, well then, still there is the, the subject of regression testing. Uh, did some research in this one, it's not really running in, in, on any of the production servers yet. Um, basically the idea is that we're going to, uh, well we're actually, data is already recorded, this access loss basically is recorded on uh, production. Um, and we're going to replay the data on our new version of the service on our acceptance environment is to figure out that it's still, you know, at least it should handle those requests because if that's a service that's to be updated on the production environment, at least it should handle the requests that its, uh, that it's uh, previous version could handle. This is our pipeline. The last time it executed was on the 5th of December. Um, and in the pipeline, I think that's the third tab, yes, that is. I try to rule out all influences that could involve demo gods and <laughs> sheep stuff. So here you can actually see what it's. It's groovy and it's the. Um, there are two ways of writing Groovy. One is the Groovy way and the other way is the Jenkins way. And they're both really different. The only way to figure out which one is the Jenkins way is by trial and error, basically. Uh, somehow the, the Jenkins version of Groovy doesn't do all the pretty things that make Groovy a neat thing to work with. Um, so here you can see the all those steps. Create a deploy node, uh, deploy something to the development environment, then you're going to do get a fix. And execute tests or board, whatever. We're going to do the same for our acceptance environment to a production environment, and eventually, if we reach this point, we post that to production. And uh, here you can actually see that there's, well, it involves a bunch of command execution, receiving back strings, parsing those, and off you go to the next uh, stage. Execute stuff. And this is actually very nasty. It's, yeah, it's uh, for looks like this. I heard people say K uh, KMRC uh, a couple of hours ago. Yeah, that's what it feels like. Um, so, are there any questions on um, this part? You, you said note. What, what is note in this case? Note? No, it was actually uh, on line 20, that's not going to happen. Yeah, uh, 17, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, this is, this is what actually uh, makes it execute on a build slate. Mm. Very basically. And what, what comes out of this one, this thing is basically uh, it's running as a closure on the node, so it's actually performing those tasks on the node. Ah, uh, okay. So ah, so the, uh, <coughs> you can also make a flyweight nodes that just are running on the, the Jenkins server. And the, the pipeline itself is running on the Jenkins master, so mm -hmm. you need to actually tell it to to delegate mm -hmm. stuff to, to build space to do yeah. the execution. Mm -hmm. So just to clarify, this, this is the uh, DSL from the the, pipe, the new pipeline, pipeline thing. Yeah. So this is this is only <coughs> this is the script that creates the that creates the pipeline that you saw on the previous slide. So, uh, mm -hmm. so this pipeline is actually built up dynamically by uh, introspecting by just looking into what's in the uh, in the Docker container, what kind of labels are in there, and processing those. Mm -hmm. and and uh, uh, the, the the this using this as a jacket file? Mm -hmm. um, it's, 
it's kind of the same idea, only it's more dense. Mm, yes, is that you, 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 you showed the, 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 the old stuff with the pipeline, just saying, okay, I have, here I have this script, or can you actually deploy this in your uh, code repository as a Jenkins file? Um, no, at, at this point there is no, uh, there is no source repository, but it, there is no source repository at this point. So, uh, you need to know where to get this that information from. You could put it in a, a Jenkins file, I suppose, although it would be a little more verbose. So this is purely the deployment pipeline, not the, uh, yeah. not the DCI part? No, it's the uh, oh, build stuff done on a yeah. different server. So it's, it's only the, the deployment and the promotion to the next environment. Actually, what, what the oh, starting point, the tree is creation of this pipeline. So the, the build, well, the compilation and, uh, of the code and building the container succeeded. Yeah. Then you got this containers with descriptors inside. Yes. So, so what a actually triggers the creation of these pipelines, deployment um, pipelines? The deployment itself is just started by that the, the CI server is just physically triggering the deployment pipeline. I have a new version and it tells, it gives you the tag of that version, uh, the, the version number as you okay. say. Um, but the pipeline is there, it's just not configured, it doesn't have stages yet because no, they will be no, taken no. later. Yeah. Okay. And it doesn't have stage, so all it has is that dynamic, that big script and all we tell it is that you know we know that this pipeline is already for a specific service, <coughs> so that's information we know beforehand. The only thing we don't know is what version of the service we're going to deploy, so that's the one parameter that we provide. Uh, <laughs> Download the container, um, which is also why it is really handy to have that thing close by because then that one is really fast. Introspecting it and based on the <coughs> label information that it point, it's going to build up a pipeline. Okay. So. The mm -hmm. reason all your tests are in your container, even if they are not just not executed. Yes. So there's there, there's no well, with an exception for the uh, for the flow tests, there is no uh, there's no separate test repository. We consider doing that, but that means that that you kind of make it harder even to to run your tests normally if you would be with, with kind of. Uh, you know, studying out rest and doing stuff like that. So the distance between the code and the, and the test would only become bigger, so we didn't do that. Um, one of the other things that, that we kept in mind while implementing those pipelines is that, that we didn't want to put a burden on the developers themselves. Like if they had to do stuff in a particular way or in different ways, that would only make it more difficult, more error prone for them to, to actually get stuff through the pipeline because I don't know somebody else messed up something in their repository from which we want to run their tests. Um, so we try to keep to keep that burden also uh, as low as possible. And so far, it worked out pretty well. Um, I uh, also wanted to share this this one with you, which is really nice. This is the, the services running on. Uh, one of our uh, environments. These are all the services. You can see here the, uh, the version and the hash. The version is actually just the number of commits that is on the master branch, so that's really simple. And it always increments, so you know, dependency resolution tools don't have a problem with that. Um, and uh, what you can see here, for example, the basket service is running uh, 993 in, in uh, test and acceptance, but it's running uh, 980 on production, so it actually 
they managed to, to get 13 commits behind. It's about time for them to, uh, to upgrade their stuff in production. So that's, that's a level of detail in which basically stuff is, uh, uh, stuff is promoted to uh, production. So also that kind of makes us feel confident that whatever we test here, has a fairly good chance of succeeding uh, here as well. Because the differences in uh, code-wise are that small on our complete landscape. Which is something that you have to take into account if you do something like this. Because, you know, if I can do my integration tests here and they succeed, but this, the, the production environment is, is lagging behind like weeks or months, then What's the value of testing stuff from the development environment that's completely different from production? Zero. So, yeah, of course, it's all not. Uh, uh, well, the environments are really end to end, like I said, so that includes. Uh, that includes backends and backends. You know, there's some stuff that they've that's been running for a couple of years and they tend to be slow every now and then. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, we consider doing mocking, but mocking puts an extra burden on development because you have to, or studying, whatever you want to call it, uh, because you have to keep that stuff running and up to date. So as long as we don't really, really need it, we don't want to add stopping or mocking this keep our environment as uh, production-like as possible. And yeah, well, lots of testing uh, depends on, on web testing for uh, uh, for integration. But that's mainly because lots of stuff is actually exercised through the web interface, and it's surface-wise, it's really shallow. It's kind of you have the, the, the website and the services underneath, and it's not like there's a lot of more service under there, so kind of exercise everything through this uh, running Selenium tests. Well, um, you say your grounds are end to end. How do you deal with uh, legacy systems that are not production line? Um, well, we managed to get them uh, production like uh, to quite some extent. Um, uh, and what we do with our data is that before you actually start running the test, we do queries on the different services to actually obtain the data and also check whether the services are uh, alive. Because you know, if there is one service, service not working, and at some point we figured it out. Uh, a couple of months ago, we had a problem with the basket service. You know, on the website there is a basket item every day. So if that thing is not properly responding, then uh, tests are climbing out and all you get is fake error messages from uh, Selenium. Well, and then it's like, you know, down the rabbit hole you go, figure out what's going on there. That's, that's, uh, so we try to do uh, at least some proper checking of front, whether at least all the services are there. And while we're doing that, we could just as well fetch some data from the service and use that in our testing. So there's, yeah, there's no hard code, it's test data, for example, when it has, that you have to make sure it's, it's the same in every environment. Mm -hmm. There are a couple of categories, like, you know, you need to have a, a thread. That's one of the most common queries that you have to on, you know, so lots of, lots of clothing and fashion stuff, so <laughs> the thread should be the least thing that you can expect in there, so <laughs> even on the test environment. Do you change that over the season? <laughs> 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 well, no, that is a it's like in the So <coughs> that's all I have to say about it. Mm -hmm. More questions? No more questions? Suggestions? My experience running your test through Selenium and today is a massive overhead. Um, 
Could it be that you just don't have fine grade unit tests that you need to offload that? Um, we have a bunch of them, and it's all also uh, you know, th those tests. They've been building those over the last couple of years, and well, except for the flow test, then uh, we wanted to to reuse them as much as possible, just to not reinvent the wheel or start messing around with it. So, uh, but at some point, uh, because it took a while for for the pipeline to be really stable and trustworthy um, because you know there are lots of issues with timing and freakiness going on um, and uh, at some point even uh, people started complaining that like, the pipelines are never working why don't we get those things well why are they not working well those tests are failing all the time so i said well and then if they're failing all the time then it doesn't make sense to run them right so we just remove them from there and then they'll be fine then they, they said, well, th that's like, that was one step too far. And then, then I got finally got them to actually look into it and fix stuff with fixing those selenium tests and make sure they're really resilient enough. That's a, that's a tough thing and it takes a lot of time. Yeah. So it's, it's no fun <laughs> that's, at all. That's about the same with an experience I had a few years ago when some, I had introduced, well, simply, simple community integration. And some of our developers came to my, to my place. Well, I keep getting spammed about failing tests. Can you stop that? All the kids to say, well, you can stop it. Fix it. Mm -hmm. And that's also like, the reason that, that we, uh, for example, if we run the web tests, we tell, uh, we tell the test script which service we are. So we're actually running tests from the, the, the site. Mm -hmm. Um, but the script tells it, well, we are a product server, so the product, so it figures out this, the suites that only have to do with the product server, so <coughs> we can limit, limit our margin of error quite a bit by just running the stuff that's actually relevant for, for that particular service. Mm -hmm. um, nowadays, people are looking into <coughs> using uh, Cypress for the for end-to-end -end testing instead of uh, Selenium. Um, I still have to see whether it, whether it works, but people are, tend to be enthusiastic about it, so... I haven't even heard okay. about it. <laughs> yeah, it, right. it doesn't require a browser. Oh, yeah. that's, that's good. <laughs> yeah, but that, that's also what we call the fan, phantom years, and that turned out that nobody's using it anymore. Do you use a source laptop or something like that? No, no, no. Uh, when it came in, they used... Uh, not source left, but the other one, something with the stack. Uh, browser stack? Browser stack, oh. yes. Um, but uh, we quickly ran into trouble uh, when we wanted to run quite a fair amount of tests on different environments. So we had a test environment for the for Belgium, we had one for the balance, and we were not able to, to open connections and make sure that, that stuff uh, worked properly in both ways. So we started building our own uh, small container with a Selenium inside, a Chrome inside, and stuff that's required. Spawned that one, and we still use that one. Um, and then the test uh, uh, from there. Uh, just a question. Um, <coughs> what are you using for uh, performance testing with load testing of your infrastructure? Also, or what do you plan for, maybe, and then uh, um, also for security as well? I, I had some, some Unity ideas, which uh, I tend to refer to as across the board. Um, <laughs> since stuff is, is running in a cloud environment anyway, um, doing an old school performance test, to me, doesn't make a lot of sense. So, uh, what we wanted to build, which we have to come to that, the only thing we did is the, the regression stuff, which is actually just using Gatling. Uh, to execute those, uh, to, to replay samples. And we wanted to use uh, Gatling as a first uh, attempt at least to, uh, to create a container and just launch that container in that particular environment and start exercising services there, uh, or basically uh, hammering one service mm. and see what, uh, what happens then. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and by doing that, basically, after every commit, you should be able to see a trend uh, rising. <coughs> and if the trend line, say, response time goes up, then you know you have something to do at some point. And if the trend line is straight or goes down, then you're pretty much in track. Mm -hmm. right. So that was the idea. But we haven't implemented that on that. Right. Sounds good. And then for, uh, for code quality and security, are you uh, using anything for that in terms of application security? Or um, not, no. We don't have, we're talking about this, there's so many place somewhere that I haven't done it. <coughs> it's, it's all running behind the gateway, and the gateway is properly assessed for, for security holes. And, uh, you want to attempt to hack them? Uh, no, shit. It's also curious whether you're running anything like Chaos MP. <laughs> no, we, we don't. Um, a colleague of mine uh, and uh, the kind of the city that he isn't here, uh, he actually wrote a plugin for uh, GameSpot, which is kind of a half life. Clone, first person shooter, and uh, every container running in our Mesos environment is represented by a uh, person, and you can actually shoot them <laughs> <laughs> to kill the containers. So they are pretty, you know, if you shoot down all the containers of, say, a password service, then you're out of password service. <laughs> <laughs> but they're like zombies, they get back up after a while. Yeah, but then, <laughs> then they revive because that's what Marathon does, so that means that they appear in the game as well. Ah, that's really cool. Is it that open source or something? Uh, yeah, and you wrote a, <laughs> you wrote a blog on it. Um, I think a bacon's blog, bacon the blog. So, uh, <laughs> nice. It's one of the two blogs on this. Can you put <laughs> a link the into the under the meetup uh, comments? Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll It would be really cool. I would like to see that. Yes. <laughs> and then I can just uh, install it and play it with the Zuber production environment. <laughs> 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 Now it's tailored to watch Marathon, but you can do the same right. with uh, uh, Mes Mesos. It's killing stuff on Mesos. That's mm -hmm. why Marathon is yeah, yeah. pretty good. Wow. Well, thanks. <laughs> thanks. Yep.